In April of 1992, an archaeologist by the name of Vindal Jones and his team discovered 600 kilos of this reddish brown organic substance that had been carefully sealed off in the rock silo within the Comrade Caves. Subsequent analysis determined that this reddish brown substance contained traces of at least eight of the 11 spices that were used in the compounding of the Keteret that was used in the temple. In 1994, the incense spices were presented to the chief rabbi of the Western Wall of Jerusalem. A sample was also given to Rabbi Obadiah Joseph, who had his own chemist analyze the mixture to confirm its ingredients. Both rabbis then requested that Vindel burn some of the incense for scientific purposes using Sodom salt and Karshia lye, which were also discovered in the cave of Qumran. Well, the results were amazing. You want to find out what happened? Stay tuned on Rebecca at the Well. In this program, we'll be exploring the healing oils of ancient scripture, along with their powerful healing constituents. Okay, so you want to know what they discovered? Well, although the spices had lost some of their potency over the last 2,000 years since their burial, it was still powerful. The residue of its fragrance lingered in the vicinity for several days following the experiment. Several people present reported that their hair and clothing retained the aroma. What's more amazing is the area in which the spices were burned changed. It had been infested with flies and ants and moths and insects. And so after burning the Keteret, there was no sign of the pest to be seen for months, some said. This is really reminiscent of the Bishna in Avot 5.5, which states that there were no flies in the area of the temple, nor was a snake or scorpion ever e even around to harm anyone in Jerusalem as long as the temple stood. Rabbi Abraham Sutton stated that he also worked with Vindel Jones in 1995, and the two men met with Avraham San of the Tiferet International Aromatherapy, who was a powerful and master perfumer who was able to authenticate and obtain nine of the original eight or 11 spices to reproduce this in the form of essential oils. In essence, San was able to parallel Vindel's discoveries both in the anointing oil as well as the Keteret in Qumran. His work was, of course, supervised under the rabbinical guidance of Rabbi Mina Chim Bernstein, the Jewish authority on the botanical essence and uh, botany and the chemistry of the temple artifacts. This was done, of course, to sidestep the strict pro uh, prohibitions they have against experimenting with the various plant materials that were in their original form. And so Rabbi Bernstein advised him that there was no proof you, you know, prohibition against enjoying the essential oil extracts of these same botanicals. In fact, he says, by getting back in touch with the mystery of the Keteret and unearthing its ancient secrets, he suggests we can awaken something in ourselves that is sorely needed at this time. And so the burning of the Keteret, which was central to all the ceremonies conducted in the temple, this is a key component required under the Ma law of Moses. Along the route, situated near the Arabian area, large amounts of incense could easily be imported. Since the Israelites were well acquainted with the use of incense in religious worship, having come from the land of Egypt. Now, when Moses received the instructions to build the temple and tabernacle, he was told to include those of which his brother Aaron was to burn every day and every evening throughout all of Israel's generations. Now, it would be each morning, the menorah would be cleaned, and each evening it was lit, and the priest would take the holy incense, a small portion, and place it upon the golden altar, in which was, of course, the center of the sanctuary, according to Exodus 30, verse 8. And so the altar of incense upon which burned the holy incense was made of shittim wood with gold. It had four horns upon each corner, similar to the Canaanite altars in Palestine. 
And so the incense in a covered vessel called the bazak was brought in by the Kohen and placed on another spoon-like vessel called kof, and then it was covered with a cloth over the pan which the priest was to carry in his hand. In Numbers chapter 17, verse 11 and 12, it says that Aaron brought the incense using a pan offered for the sins of the people. Now, that's really important when you think about it. So I'm going to repeat that. Aaron brought the incense using the pan he offered the sins of the people. So both Aaron's sons had their own pan, according to Leviticus 10.1, as well as the other Levites who also sacrificed on pants and was used to burn this offering in the tabernacle. So apparently every priest had his own censer. Now using tongs or a gold censer, and I have tongs here that I use for my incense, they were to remove the hot coals from the altar sacrifice and place them upon the altar incense twice daily, after which the incense would be sprinkled upon. And so the prominent position of the altar of incense in the holy place was directly before the tabernacle or in the temple. And a special offering of incense was made on the day on which the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, entered the holy place, carrying in his right hand the pan of incense filled with live coals, and in his left hand a spoon-like vessel called the cough containing the incense. Now, that's very prophetic, so I'm really getting excited about this, because the right hand is symbolic of authority, but the left hand is symbolic of a future prophetic event, and it pertains to you. You see, he was acting out a charade, because it's the left hand in which he was carrying the incense. If I haven't told you all about this lately, hold on, I'm going to get to that, okay? So now, after placing both of these utensils on the floor, the high priest took the incense from the cough with the hollow of his hand and heaped it upon the hot coals. And so the high priest then placed the blood from the sacrifice upon the horns of the altar of the incense, which of course is foreshadowing Yeshua, our high priest, who would sacrifice his own life for the sins of all mankind. And then the high priest entered the Holy of Holies, where he burned incense in the golden censer, just as our Messiah and high priest does in the presence of Yahweh in heaven. This is in Hebrews 9, 6, if you want to go check that. And so the rabbis teach that the incense then was compounded, right? It would be 368 measures, which is corresponding the year, so the solar year of 365 days, and then they would have another extra portion for that day of the Yom Kippur, okay? And so they would take half in the morning, half in the evening, where each year a new batch would be prepared, one for each day. And so uh, a daily amount would have been about five pounds that would be burned daily. And so this was part of the morning service and, of course, a part of the uh, Mishka, the evening service, afternoon service. So these extra three measures that were reserved for Yom Kippur and anything else left over would have been carried over to the next year. And so it's sort of interesting, sort of like, you know, when you make your own bread dough and you share a, a batch with a neighbor and you keep adding to uh, someone else's portion. So this gets to be carried on through that. And so there would be, at the end of a certain amount of time, accumulated amount where they would only have to make half as much, and that was every 70 years. Is that interesting? I think that's pretty prophetic. Have you ever wondered what that cloud by day and that pillar of, that pillar of night was when Yahweh spoke to the children of Israel during Exodus? Why? It was the burning of the incense. It, was, it would rise up like a pillar to the throne of Yahweh. And this is where the priests would commune with him. There is so much more to this, and I get really excited. I've written a book about it called The Keteret. But let me just close with this. You see, as it was then, so it is today. God can only be approached through the incense of prayer. It's with a sincere heart and thanksgiving with worship. You see, prayer is like incense. It has to pierce through that darkness of hopelessness. And we get to go into the very presence of God. You see, it's with our altar of sacrifice, our Savior who suffered 
and offered himself as a perfect sacrifice. He did so willingly so we could have access to the Father. And so the altar where the incense was burned, located on the mercy seat, represents Yahweh's throne. And it tells us in Matthew 27 and verse 31 that Yeshua is our high priest. Amen. And we have access now because the veil is rent. And he continues to make intercession on our behalf before the Father. So why not today allow the coals of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, to burn away the dross and the sin that hinders your communication with God? He will reveal those things to the, you that you need to pray about. And he wants you to come to him. Why he's wanting and desiring your presence. Amen. One of the ingredients that the scriptures identifies as part of the holy incense is galbanum. I want to share this video we made about that. Let's watch now. In Exodus 30, verse 34 through 36, the instructions for mixing the holy incense are given. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Take unto thee sweet spices, stati, onica, galbanum, these sweet spices with pure frankincense. Of each shall there be a like weight, and thou shalt make it a perfume, a confection after the art of the apothecary, tempered together, pure and holy. And thou shalt beat some of it very small, and put of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation, where I will meet with thee, it shall be unto you most holy. The Old Testament Apocrypha, dating back to 180 BC, mentions the formula for holy incense in Sirach 2415, a thousand years after Moses. Most of the spices and perfumes that made up the temple incense were lovely and fragrant, but galbanum had an earthier, parsley-like smell. The Jewish Talmud suggests that galbanum, a less than wonderfully fragrant resin, was included in the holy incense because every communal fast that does not include the sinners of Israel is not a fast. The Hebrew word for galbanum is keleb, which means the fat or the richest part. The Torah instructed the priest that when he offered up the goat as an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma, all the keleb, the fat, belonging to the Lord, was forbidden for human consumption. You see, believers are to be lean and to avoid fulfilling their lust of worldly affections. The excess Yah gives a believer is to be offered up back to him to complete his mission and ministry on earth, not for believers to be lazy and gluttonous with. The ritual of burning incense in ancient times it's very common. In fact, we see in scripture a number of times, not only did Aaron and the Cohen priests communicate with God on behalf of the people using incense, we see Abraham throughout scripture had built numerous altars and, and made sacrifices to Yah. Today, this tradition continues in some churches with the use of resins as frankincense, myrrh, and rosa sharon. Now at home, using incense and diffusing oils is an excellent way to bring your prayer time into focus and that will carry your prayers to heaven. These fragrances can serve as a powerful communication tool and as a reminder of their spiritual purpose, which can shift any of those hindrances in the heavenly realm. If you think that this practice was only for the Old Testament believers, maybe you wanna consider this. In the book of Revelation, chapter 8, verse 3 and 4, it tells us, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was much given unto him, much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. You see, this has yet to come. Now, for your own personal time, you might want to consider creating an altar at home, which you can place objects that are sacred to you for your spiritual journey. For example, the Holy Scriptures, a heart, a cross, or maybe some pictures of your family. I like to light a candle and place some fresh flowers in the room. You can also add soft music, worshipful music, that is both relaxing and uplifting. 
Now as you begin, you want to be calm and just sort of settle your nerves down by focusing on the light. Concentrate on a flickering flame of the candle maybe as you pray and ask the Holy Spirit to guide you and lead you. Invite God into this time to honor you with his presence. And if you have any essential oils that maybe you've selected for this use, you can pray and ask Yahweh to bless those oils and to make them sacred for this time. Now you want to ask God to bless this time that you have together with him. The Spirit may direct you to pray a particular prayer or a scripture, or even think of maybe some people in your life that you want to pray for. It's okay just to sit quietly in his presence and just listen to what the Spirit is saying. He might even be quiet too. Remember, you are a priest of God. It says in 1 Peter 2, 9, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. You see, because of what Yeshua did, we can go boldly before the throne of grace. If you have an oil that you've prayed over, you might want to sprinkle it on the altar or place or in your home and make it diffuse it in your room and don't forget to be thankful be grateful for everything that he's given you that's very important give thanks to God for the many blessings as many as you can think of give thanks for the ones you do that things that you desire give thanks for what you're about to receive remember give thanks always and be sure to record your answers maybe in a notebook or in your journal. And when you're ready to end your prayer time, simply blow out the candle and return to your regular routine. Okay, today I want to show you how to make diffuser blimps for around your house. Diffusing oils in your home is a nice way to set the mood, freshen and brighten a sick room, or add atmosphere to a social event. These are so easy to make and use. If you're using a tea light holder for this, you're going to want to add a little bit of water so the oils don't burn and sit on the heat too much. For electric nebulizers, you can add your blend directly into the well. There's really no water necessary. And that's what I have here, where we can add them directly into our nebulizer. Now for the kitchen, which is a central area for the home, this is where everybody wants to congregate, right? And this is the area you want to smell really nice. So for a kitchen blend, I wanna go ahead and make one for you because they're so simple. We're going to start with two drops of grapefruit essential oil. One, two. Now, if you don't have one of these reducer tops, you can just go ahead and use a nice little dropper. 
or you know, simply get one of the little pipettes. For our second oil, we want to use two drops of pettigrain. And if you're not familiar with pettigrain, it actually comes from the leaf of the orange tree. And for the third oil, I'm going to use sweet orange, or you can use tangerine, which is really nice. So you can see the three oils I've chosen are very bright. I'm going to do two drops of this one as well. Now use a glass stir rod and just stir this up. Check and make sure you like it. And it smells wonderful. So you could just actually pour this right into your diffuser and have it in your kitchen. And even if you don't have a fancy nebulizer or diffuser to use, you could just simply put a pan of water on the stove at very, very low heat and just pour this right in and stir it and let it make your room smell wonderful. All right, so let's look at the living room. Now this is where everybody likes to socialize, right? And so for this space, we want to make it inviting and set the mood. And so for our living room where we like to read and relax, I'm going to go with a blend using uh, frankincense. So let's go ahead and find this one. All right, so I'm going to use two drops of frankincense. And I'm going to add two drops of lavender. Okay, and for my third oil, I'm going to add two drops of rosemary. I think that was three though. <laughs> so again, we just want to stir and make sure we like it. It's very nice. It's a very unusual combination of oils, somewhat relaxing while at the same time very stimulating, invigorating with the rosemary. Okay, so that's our living room. Now over here, when we look at the bedroom, we want this to be very relaxing, enhance sleep, right? For those who maybe have trouble sleeping at night. So for this one, we're going to start with adding two drops of marjoram. Now marjoram is a hypotensive oil, so it's not only great for sleeping, it lowers the blood pressure, helps to dilate the vessels and and I'm going to grab the lavender over here. So we're going to do two drops of lavender. That's a favorite and an easy oil to find just about anywhere now. And for my third essential oil, I'm going to go with rum and chamomile. And all of these are really great oils to use in a baby's room. Now, you don't need much in a baby's room. You only want to use one or two drops of essential oil and let it diffuse maybe before they go into the room to sleep at night, and then turn it off. You don't need to keep it running all night. Now the bathroom is where you want to sort of mask those unpleasant odors, but you don't want to use those chemistry-based products. So in that case, we want to make a blend that's going to de disinfect the space, right? So in that case, I think I'm going to use orange, peppermint, and maybe even tea tree. I have those over here. Now for the home office, this is where you want your area to help you to stay alert and focused, right? You want to focus on your business. And so for this blend, I'm going to be using two drops of lemon. Lemon is very helpful in stimulating your mind and focus. And I'm going to add two drops of basil. And then I need to grab my rosemary over here. Let's see. Because rosemary, again, helps to your mind to stay focused. Now, if you are working in a place where they don't allow to, you to use any kind of fragrances, I carry a pocket diffuser with me. Now, with this one, it's a lot like an inhaler. You're going to want to place your oils inside it using a nice pipette. You just grab your oil and put it down in the little holes. Put your little top on, carry it with you. And so when you're at home or at work, you just carry it with you and just smell. It's nice. Now, if you are lucky enough to have a gym at home and you work out, well, you need something to help motivate you and get you moving. For that, I would use black pepper, ginger, and even, again, rosemary. That's a nice one. For those who like to entertain outdoors, you might want to choose oils that are right for helping to keep those pests away. So in that case, I would use citronella, and even lavender for that blend. 
And of course, when there's that laundry room with that damp and moldy scents that sometimes accumulate there, you want to prevent this by freshening that space with grapefruit, lemon, or lemongrass. And so you have it. They're just that easy to make, and I hope you'll enjoy them. Okay, Connie in Bradenton, Florida writes, what are essential oils? Well, essential oils are concentrated extracts of certain plants, grasses, herbs, trees, and they could be derived from everything, fruit, leaves, roots, stems, flowers, seeds, and just about everything. They are called essential because they contain the very essence of the plant and they are very aromatic with therapeutic properties. So they're very good to help with all kinds of conditions. Thank you so much for watching our program today. We are privileged to be a part of your life. And if you have any questions that you would like to ask me, please feel free to visit us at Facebook. Thank you for watching Rebecca Thewell.